Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, May 1st, and we are picking up where we left off last time in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. Very, very quick review to bring us into verse 4. From verse 1 on, we had the angel that came down out of heaven, had the keys, showing authority, took Satan and put him in the pit. Yay! Yay. <laughs> so that he is seized and chained there for 1,000 years. Remember, we're going to see that phrase 1,000 years six times in a little over seven verses, I think it is, um, within this chapter anyway. Uh, he is put into the pit, the, the um, lid is over the pit. He is not able to come out to deceive the nations at all during that time. That means that the people who are alive and living during the millennial period will not be personally attacked by Satan and I believe his henchmen, I believe they are bound also at this time, to come against them. Now they're still human, they still are born with a sin nature, they are still born with a free will. God did never, he did never, good English, did not ever make people puppets where he pulls strings and says, tell me you love me, tell me you'll obey me. He doesn't want that. He wants that free heart to come and want to adore him, want to live for him, want to love him, want to be in obedience. We're going to talk about those people during the tribulation. I talked about the tribulation for so long, forgive me, during the millennial time as we come to them in this chapter. So let's just go right into the fact, well, let me just tell you, because I put them in the pit, and that's where he belongs for a thousand years. At the end of the thousand years, we saw at the end of verse 3, he's loosed for a little season. Since God has this purpose for him, that's why he was not cast into the lake of fire when the beast and the false prophet were cast into the lake of fire. When God is done with him completely, he also will be cast into the lake of fire. But God is in control, God's timing is perfect, and God's ways are perfect. And we know that he's only going to be loose for a short time. That's what a little season means, if that's the way your, your version uh, describes it. We'll see what he does in that short time and talk about the people that it affects as we come to it in this chapter. So let's just pick up in verse 4. Then I saw thrones, and those seated on them received authority to judge. Um, I think I'll stop right there before I read the next phrase. Okay, the thrones that are seen could possibly be the thrones that we saw in chapters 4 and, and chapter 5. I know that's way back in your memories, because we did all the tribulations since. But remember, chapters 4 and 5 were a heavenly scene. We saw the throne room of heaven. We saw it's a very active throne room. We saw it's noisy, didn't we? It is not quiet. And you won't need earplugs. You won't want earplugs. We're going to join that chorus, and we're going to sing the hallelujahs also. We saw that the 24 elders who we decided represent us, the, the believers in this time period that we call the church age. And uh, those uh, elders are sitting on thrones. They are lesser thrones than the Lord God Almighty, who is sitting on the throne. His throne is like a left seat. It's big enough for two. God the Father, God the Son, because God the Son is sitting at the right hand, at the right hand <laughs> of the Father. Okay, so we're seeing thrones that are lesser. He has the ultimate throne. He is on his throne. He is in control. When we talk about the Lord sitting on a throne on earth in Yerushalayim, comma, Israel, during the millennial time, that does not take him away from sitting on the throne in heaven. He is God. He is able to sit in the heavens on his throne and he is able to be on earth he is in control always he is not waiting to be made king he is king he is king of kings he is lord of lords and let it out i heard the hallelujah i have no problem with that in this class i'll have a problem if you don't <laughs> and if you like me it'll explode so you gotta let it out okay so um even though we believe that that um that the 24 elders' thrones are representing us. I believe what we're seeing here is representative of Old Testament saints and New Testament saints, okay? Those who were before the church age also. Um, we'll go into more of that, but we do know that besides this heavenly throne that we see and know is, is current and happening and always, we know also that there is this promise of this earthly reign over the kingdom of Israel. We know that God made promises to the nation of Israel to raise Israel up as the head nation for the world. We know that Israel was to be raised up. In fact, initially, Israel was to be the kingdom of priests taking the gospel to the rest of the world. 
We know that they didn't fulfill their duty, and God did not say, oh, you're bad, I'm done with you, throw you away. No, we do not believe in replacement theology here. God did not replace Israel with the church. God raised up another body with, that we call the church to hopefully, prayerfully, cause Israel to become jealous when they see that something that this church has that's so precious was in their hands first. That's the oracles of God, the gospel message of God. When they see this church, or as, as is commonly called Gentile, although please realize I'm Jewish and I'm part of that, so it's not literal that it's Gentile only, but when we see that God has a plan to use the Gentiles who come to saving faith as the priest to take the gospel out, which is what is happening right now, that hopefully Israel says, hey, wait a minute. That was mine first. <laughs> now, instead of being a selfish little grab it and take it back, let's work together. Let's come together. Let's be one in Yeshua, the one new man, Jew and Gentile together, who come to the Father for salvation in the same way through the shed blood of Yeshua, Jesus. No other name under heaven whereby we can be saved except the name of Yeshua, Jesus. That does away with dual covenant theology also, which says the Jews are saved one way and the rest of the world is saved another way, or even worse, the Jews are all saved. Don't you know? Romans says all of Israel will be saved. That's not talking about the individuals that need to ask the Lord into their heart because never, nowhere do you see a nation save a people when we're talking about sin. It is individual. It is every individual responsibility, whether you're Jewish or whether you're Gentile. You have to come to that saving faith. So with all of that as our basis and understanding, we know that God worked with Israel as, with Israel as a nation. Israel did reject the Lord in his first coming. They did not recognize him as Messiah. They were looking for the Messiah who would come and fulfill all the scriptures that said, I'll break the bonds that are over you. I will set you up as head nation. You'll be the head and not the tail, etc., etc. Those scriptures are still every bit as true as the scriptures that said he would come as suffering servant, that he would come lowly, riding on a donkey, that he would suffer, that the chastisement of God would be placed on him for the sins of the world, for forgiveness of sin, that he would be the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world, that he would be the Lamb that we see sacrificed from the very beginning, first the Lamb for a man, then the Lamb for a family, then the Lamb for a nation, and finally we see it's the Lamb for the world, praise God, the sinless Lamb of God. All of this in their minds, they should have recognized he had to come deal with that sin issue, almost a question, it's not a question, that sin issue. There has to be sinless blood placed on the altar for forgiveness of sin. That's recorded all the way back in the Jewish scriptures. And oh, by the way, it's Jewish scriptures from Bereshit Genesis to Revelation, the revealing of Yeshua HaMashiach, the first four words of Revelation 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. I just gave it to you in the Hebrew, that's all. It's all Jewish. It's not that it's, oh, this part's for the Jews and this part's for the Christians. No, 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 no. And we even, if we want to get real technical, shouldn't say old and new because it sounds like the old is done away with. Let's call it the original. Let's see the fulfillment of the new because in the original, Jeremiah 31, we have the promise of the new covenant. The new covenant would be in his blood. Then we come to the Passover Seder that you've just gone through with me, and you see in here very clearly how Messiah took the bread, unleavened bread, because that's what they were eating. Unleavened because leaven represents sin. And he's going to say, this bread is a picture of me. Well, how could that bread be a picture of our Savior if it had leaven in it? It wouldn't be a picture, but it was sinless in its appearance. It would be striped, bruised, pierced, broken, buried, brought back, and the prize is found. Everything, a picture of what Yeshua, Jesus, was going to do. And then you would see him return again in second coming to have all of those promises of the kingly throne, reigning, supreme, Israel lifted up, the nations come to Israel, to the temple of God, to worship him, to bring in their <coughs> sacrifices, their first fruits, to bring in all that they're wanting to give to the Lord, that they go home and be blessed in their nations. Isn't God awesome? What a plan. What a magnanimous plan. So in that plan, 
God chose a people to work through for all time. And that's why everything really in scripture we look at through the lens of Israel. There's much more history that took place than what's recorded in the word of God. It's recorded in historic books. Those are good books. Those are interesting facts to know. But they're nothing like the word of God. They're nothing that's powerful, living, and affects our lives today. What we need to know and pour ourselves into, we need to know God's plan. And he gave us his plan in relation to Israel. And he chose Israel because Israel was puny. <laughs> Israel was lacking. Israel wasn't looking like something great and mighty and all that. So that everyone would see and have to realize and say, wow, that's God. Remember Rahab? You call it Rahab. Remember when they were coming in, they were going to battle in Jericho, the first city is going to fall without the Israelis shooting one shot. And not shots back then, but they didn't do one bow and arrow. <laughs> okay. It's going to fall inward, not the way walls normally fall. That way it's, it falls against the people who were in the wrong, and the Israelis have the victory. But who got victory also? Rahab. A harlot. Hello? Oh, she was a respectable, good person that God said, you're so good, I'm going to... No. <laughs> but she said, I've heard about your God. I've heard about his exploits. I know God is with you. I want to be on that side. I want, I have faith in your God. Is basically what she was saying, and God honored her for it. Said, bring into your household your whole family, because the whole family was believing as a unit, and the family was spared. That's our God at work. It is not exclusive that, that the rest of the world cannot see and cannot be blessed, but they have to come in the way God ordained it. And at that time, it was through the Jewish nation who he was working through to get that glory. You notice how Rahab didn't say, I see you guys, you're big and you're mighty, you're the Goliaths, you're the giants, you're the ones that, you know, we're, we're just so little, we're afraid of you. She didn't say that, did she? I heard about your God. That's where it's at. I heard about your God. And so in that, we see that God has this plan. He moves through the Jewish nation. And when they drop the ball, he lovingly child trains them. The same way you as a parent lovingly child train your child. And you don't kick your child to the curb and say, I don't want you because you've been naughty. No, in fact, you love them all the more when they're naughty, don't you? <laughs> because they need you all the more. And you try to bring them back. And that's what the Lord is doing even now. He's calling his Jewish people back the same as he's calling his Gentile people back. And he's going to continue with his plan because God never said, oops, boy, plan B, uh, let me think this through. No, no, not for her. He's always been in control. He's always had the plan. He knew what man was going to do. He knew Israel was going to let down. And in that, he brought in a beautiful picture of love to you, dear Gentiles, because you're loved just as much as his Jewish people. He doesn't love you any less. He created you too. And so now through you, dearly beloved Gentiles, you have the privilege of serving our God. You have the privilege of going to our Jewish people and saying, hey, I love your Jewish God. You can talk like Rahab. I've heard about your God. And if you want to get on the right foot, start with a Jewish person who knows anything about their heritage, talk to them and say, I believe in your God, the God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you'll see they're in tangible. Hey, wait a minute. They're not talking about another God. That's my God. That's my great, 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 great granddaddy that you just mentioned. What are you doing with him? How does this relationship work? And then as God gives you opportunity and time, you show through the Jewishness of Scripture. Open up Matthew, your very first book that they're afraid of, the Jewish people, because they think that's somebody else's. They think that's for those Christians who worship three gods. No, we worship one God who shows himself in three parts. But look at the very beginning. I love it. Who said, Who told them to put Matthew first? You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all do the Gospels. They all tell the, the story of the life of Yeshua, Jesus on earth. Who said to put Matthew first? 
Absolutely. A plus Rosa. <laughs> God did it. Why did God do it? Why did he put it first? Because, exactly. Good for Irma. Another A plus. As I open up as a Jewish person, and, and maybe this is my first little peek at that that we think isn't part of our scriptures, and I read right there in the beginning, the book of the genealogy of, and I'll put it in my Hebrew, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. Okay. Hmm. Next phrase. First verse. We haven't gotten down to verse one. The son of David. Oh, wait a minute. Is that my king, Melch David, King David, that I respect, that I think was a pretty cool guy? He was a man after God's own heart. Is that the one that came over with C? The son of Avram. Avram. Hey, wait a minute. What's my Jewish granddaddy doing in that Christian book? <laughs> Maybe I can keep reading. And I read on. Avram begot Yitzhak. Yitzhak begot Yaakov. Yaakov begot Judah and his brethren. Wow. There's no doubt. You're talking about those forefathers that I revere. Abraham, Yitzhak, and Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and out of Jacob came the twelve tribes. So why is Judah emphasized? Because the king comes out of the tribe of Judah, mm -hmm. the lion of the tribe of Judah. What? This is Jewish all over the place. Maybe it's okay to keep reading. And as I keep reading, and the Bruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, comes upon them, prayerfully they come to saving faith. I know it to be true. I know the Jewish women hiding in the attic of a pastor in World War II. He opened his doors to bring in a family out of risk for himself and his family. If he's caught hiding Jews, he and his family are killed also. And yet he felt compelled by God to hide a family in his attic. He opened his heart and he opened his doors. Now they have to be as quiet as church mice <laughs> during the day. Because there are people that come in and go out of this parishioner's home all day long. So they have to be so quiet. But at night, you can sneak down into my library, get a book, take it back up, and you got something to read to help your mind to stay quiet during the day. So that's what this family did. They went through his library. They picked out whatever book they wanted. And finally the time came when this Jewish woman took the Bible up with her. She had avoided it because she knew it had those other books in it. But this wasn't what she called her Bible. This was that Christian Bible. So she took it and thought, well, I'll just read my part. And she did. But then she got to the day that she was to the end of, her, of that part. Something tugged at her to take a peek like I just showed you. And she did exactly what I said. What? I thought this was Christian. What's my Jewish family doing in his book? And she kept reading. She fell in love with Yeshua. Fell in love with him. She is living the story as if it's happening with her. And she comes up to the point where they're crying out, crucified. And she thought, oh no, he's the hero. Surely they're not going to put him to death. They can't kill him. And she's so sure that when he does die on the cross, she was so crushed. You know what she did? She closed the Bible, and she quit reading, and she cried three days. She mourned for him in the tomb for three days. Is this not amazing? What a story. True story. And on that third day, she couldn't leave it alone anymore. And she picked it back up, and she started reading it reading and read of the resurrection and hallelujah in the resurrection power opening her heart to her Messiah and Savior. Saved in the attic, hiding from the Nazis who wanted to put her to death for no other reason than she was Jewish. But is that my God at work? Oh, yes. And did he use a dear Gentile to reach that Jewish girl? Yes. Realize how valuable you are. Besides being loved, you're valued to work for our Lord, same as I am. So we've got promises that are given to Israel. And if God is not going to fulfill those promises, we need to worry. Because if he can pull back there, he can pull back here. And I stand here today telling you I don't have one little 
hair on my head, one little tiny toe or anything in between that shakes in fear of God keeping his word. I know it, that I know it, that I know it. I've seen it, I've heard it, I stake my life on it, and I'm not the first nor the last to be that way. God keeps every word. I wore the right shirt today. <laughs> God keeps his promises. He promised Israel that they would have one sit on the throne of David. This is 1 Samuel chapter 7, 2 Samuel chapter 7. Sorry, I do that every time. 2 Samuel tells us that there would be one who sits on David's throne forever. You can read it on your own. Start around verse 14. Take it. You can read it on your own. I'm going to let you trust me that, I, that what I'm telling you is true because it's there. I want to get on to what I want to show you. Because God promised that, we need to see that fulfilled. We need to see God keeps his word. He promised many promises to Israel. Let's look even at what he promised in that new covenant book that people want to separate and say, one's Jewish and one's Christian, which you'll never hear out of my mouth. Let's look what he said to his Talmudim in Matthew 19, 28. Who are his Talmudim? Those are his disciples. Those are the ones who are following him that he is training. They are the ones who are going to carry out for him when he goes back to heaven. And they are the ones who laid the foundation that was built on. We know Sha'ol Paul is raised up, Jewish by birth, comes to believe in Yeshua Jesus, and gives us many of our um, books that we read today with marching orders for us. Go to Matthew 19, verse 28. In Matthew 19, 28, Yeshua said to them, Yes, I tell you that in the regenerated world, in the world to come, when the Son of Man, Messianic title, Son of Man, we saw that in Daniel, Daniel, many other places, sits on his glorious throne. You who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. Remember that, they're going to be judging. Okay, we're going to come to that part. But you see what he's saying to his Jewish Talmudim? There's going to be a time I'm going to sit on an earthly throne, and when I do, you're going to sit on 12 thrones, and you're going to judge Israel. Okay, that's just one of the promises there. Let me take you also to Luke chapter 22. Remember, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a thing be established. And again and again and again, because I've got somebody new today, I'm not going to take the chance of not saying it. Don't believe anything in this class because Rochelle says it. Rochelle's weight, 100 plus pounds, <laughs> I'll say how many, is worthless. <laughs> Believe it because you see it in the Word of God. Stake your life on it because you see it in the Word of God. Take it to your bank. Cash it in because it's the Word of God. Luke chapter 22, verse 28. Luke 22, verse 28. And we never take one scripture and build everything over. We see out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. We see the coming together of the scriptures. We see different authors, different backgrounds, different times. All in agreement. That helps us know that we're on track with the message also. Verse 28, you are the ones who have stayed with me throughout my trials. Who's he talking to? His immediate. They're the ones who were there with him. Just as my father gave me, Yeshua Jesus speaking, gave me the right to rule. So I give you an appointment, namely to eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and to sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Luke just confirmed what we read first by Matthew. Okay, so we got two mouths, two witnesses, and we're going to see it in Revelation, which is the mouth of Yohanan John. We've got two or three witnesses establishing this fact. There are going to be thrones on earth ruling over Israel. There's going to be one who's head over them. You've got order. You've got Messiah, 12 uh, Talmud, and you've got people on earth. Israel in particular, who's going to be taking it out to the nations. Okay, now, the New Testament body of the Messiah. That's us. Okay? We also have promises. Well, let's look at Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 verse 21. Remember chapters 2 and 3 give us the church age. They not only were actual churches at the time when we talked about each of them and what they were like at that time, but we also saw that it extended over a period of time that we could see uh, prophetically that now we're looking back because we're in that last stage. We're in the Church of Philadelphia. If you're in a Laodicean church, you're not hearing the gospel. You're not sending out missionaries to reach the world. You're not feeling the, the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through you and impacting your life and the lives of those around you. If you're in that kind of a church, 
get out. <laughs> that is, if the church of the Lord says, I want to spew it out of my mouth. It's not hot where it's good. It's not cold where it's good for something. It's good for nothing. That if you are in a church that's teaching you the Bible is the word of God, live by it, act upon it, go out, share, tell, reach others, then you're in a good place because you're part of Philadelphia. Now, chapter 3 and verse 21 says, speaking to the churches in general, the believers, I will let him who wins the victory, how, how do we win the victory? Remember 1 John 5, 4, we overcome <coughs> by our faith. Those are in the faith are the overcomers. That means even those who die, who get beheaded, who have, like Rachel Scott, or she's blown away because she believed in Jesus. They're not failing. They're not lost. They didn't miss out. They are victorious. They, she got to reward before we did. That's all. <laughs> but they were victorious. We who are part of this are victorious. The ones who win the victory sit with me on my throne, just as I myself also won the victory and sat down with the Father on his throne. Now, he's telling us what happened after his death, burial, and resurrection, isn't he? Satan, I think, was doing a dance on the day he died. I think Satan thought, I've done it. I've won, or I'm winning, at the very least, is what I think he said. And three days later, when the earth literally shook, earthquake, and the power of God was revealed, why was that stone rolled away? It was not rolled away to let him out, people. <laughs> it was rolled away to show he was out, to show an empty tomb, to bring to the attention of his followers, I am not here. I have risen. I am alive forevermore. But that is power. That's the resurrection power of God. That's the power we work in, and that's the power that gives victory. Yeshua was not failing. He was not down when he died. He was completing his purpose that he came for. His life was not taken from him. His life was given freely by himself. He, he stretched out his arms. He shed his blood by choice that he could take that blood, put it on the mercy seat in heaven, and open up the way of heaven for us for all of time. That's victory. He ascended into heaven, sitting at the right hand of the Father. That's victory. Sit here till I make your enemies your footstool. When he comes back and puts down the last of, the, of what's going on at that time in that battle of Armageddon and comes in victory, he is the one who tramples through and shows that he is a victorious one. Out of his mouth comes the sword, the sharp word of God, and it annihilates. That Antichrist who is full, literally, of the power of Satan because Satan has indwelt him, finds himself cast into the lake of fire, and Satan finds himself put in the abyss. You tell me where that's not victory. You tell me where he's not ruling and reigning, where he is not sitting on the throne. He has victory. He has sat down at the right hand of the Father till it is time to come back and to set down an earthly kingdom of rule and reign. We see his hand and his power now, though. It's not waiting to start until then. It started from the moment of his resurrection. Amen. We see the power come Amen. on those waiting in the upper room that he said, wait until you're endued with power. Yeah. The power would come down from on high. That's the start of what we call the church age. When that Holy Spirit, Ruch HaKodesh, came on those people. And what were they able to do? Give the gospel in every language that was there to hear. They didn't go to school first and study and learn it. The power of God came on them and enabled them to Amen. give out the truth. They took that back to their homes. Why were they there? Because it's one of the three pilgrimages that every Jewish person had to go up to Jerusalem for. They were there bringing in their first fruits. They were there being obedient to God. And he anointed them with his power because it didn't just land on the twelve. But those who heard and accepted took that power back to their homes. And when they went back, I can only imagine, guess what? I've got to tell you what I saw, what I heard, what has happened. And boom, we see the church unleashed. Now, are we doing a good job today? Sadly, we have Laodicea that's not. We have Philadelphia that is. But God is not dependent on the church either. And his power doesn't end there either. His power is the power of the Holy Spirit who works on people, 
who right now is indwelling us. Our security, we talked about this last week, our engagement ring as good as marriage. Till we're home, delivered safely by the power of the Ruach HaKodesh, that he will continue on in that tribulation. His power is still in effect. If it were not, no one would be saved. And the world would come to an end. That here he is showing that he is going to conquer even that evil that comes after work on in the tribulation period. And he is going to raise Israel up and fulfill her promises. So we as a body are promised. We're going to also, um, he'll let him who wins the victory sit with me on my throne. Just as I myself win the victory and sat down with my father on his throne. Look at chapter 5 and verse 10. Chapter 5, still a heavenly vision is before we see uh, the tribulation start in chapter 6. And in 5 and verse 10, we read, You, God, made them into a kingdom for God to rule. Kohanim, priests, to serve him. And they will rule over the whole earth. Okay? God is at work. And he is using us also at this time. Go with me for it to be a little more clear in 1 Corinthians. Uh, 1 Corinthians, written by Shaol, Paul, a very good Jewish boy, wrote to a very carnal church, very carnal, not doing what they should. He writes to straighten them out. In verse 1, he's saying, How dare one of you with a complaint against another go to court before pagan judges and not before God's people? Hello? You've got a problem and you're taking your problem to the outside world to judge who doesn't know me? Why are you not coming in order and coming to me for your wisdom, for your judging, and for things to be done right? So he's calling people to task. But look at verse 2. Don't you know that God's people are going to judge the universe? If you're going to judge the universe, are you incompetent to judge these minor matters? Hello? If you're going to have the, the wisdom to judge in that world to come that we call the millennium, then why are you struggling with a problem here right now? Turn to me for your wisdom. Get your counsel from me. I'll show you what to do. And I give that word of advice to all of us. We should not be going to the world for our judgments, for our wisdom, for our guidance. The world is not in a place to give that to us. If you need help, seek godly counsel. Seek wisdom. And with that wisdom, get knowledge. And know how to apply it is the, the godly wisdom that is available to anyone who asks. Anyone. Okay, what else are we promised? Second Timothy. Timothy was Shaul Paul's son in the Lord. Part Jewish, part Gentile. We call him Gentile. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12. If we, and this is, this is Shaul Paul giving charges to Timothy, teaching him, training him. He basically is going to turn the baton over to Timothy. And he knows that. He's in prison. He knows he could be facing the end of his life, and it wasn't long before he did face the end of his life. He doesn't want what he has to end, so he's being right, obedient to God, to pour it into faithful men who will take it and do likewise. He set Timothy up as a head to be listened to. He's pouring into Timothy, and he tells Timothy, if we persevere, if we hang in there with the Lord, we will also rule with him. Now, notice, we might not do that. If we disown him, is the version that I have here, you may have a different word. Deny. deny. Okay, if you deny him, he will also deny us. Oh, people jump on that and say, oh, well, look out, you can lose your salvation. He's going to deny you. No, what's he talking about? He's talking about ruling and reigning. Okay? He's going to deny you ruling and reigning if you haven't proven to be a faithful and trustworthy servant. If you've got a classroom full of children and you have little... Everybody picks on Johnny. I'll pick on him. On, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think of a non-biblical name, and all I can think of is Bible names. <laughs> How about A? <laughs> we'll, we'll just call him A, okay? <laughs> if you've got A over here acting up and not being responsible and doing everything, you know, to be honoring to cause problems, are you going to give him a responsibility that's very important, that really needs wise hands to deal with it. No, you're going to go over to child B, who's been listening to you, who's been showing you obedience and respect, and who shows a, a development, a maturity. They're ready to handle it. Well, that's what God's saying here. If you deny me here and now, if you're not doing for me now, when you have this chance to serve me, to honor me, to work for me in the ways that I've asked you to do, and you blow it, well, I'm not going to trust you in the kingdom to be a wise leader to tell somebody else how to do it. 
you don't have anything to give to them. You're not going to be able to talk to them from your personal um, example. You're not going to be able to talk to them by saying, here's how I was guided. Here's the word of God and what it said to me. Those people that are going out and judging with the Lord need to have the wisdom of the Lord. They need to have been proven that they have and walk in the wisdom of the Lord. Roger, we're freezing people out. <laughs> you want to turn it up a little bit? So it's only talking about ruling and reigning. That's all that he's going to deny you. You're going to miss out on the blessing of being a ruler, of being a leader, of being one that the Lord can say, here, I've got a duty for you. Wouldn't you love for the Lord to be able to say that to you? Yes, there is a Matthew uh, 10, 36. 33 does say, but whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my father. Has. Yes, yes. If you deny him before men, I don't belong to the Lord. I'm not his. He is not mine. Then why would he open up heaven and let you in? You're not his child. Notice it's not saying that you'll lose your salvation here either. You've denied. You do not believe. How many of us know people right now who do not believe, who would not say the Lord is Lord, King of Kings, and the one to be in right relationship with? They're the ones that are being denied, yes. And we're going to get into Matthew 25, which will also bring out clearly the talents, and will show from the talents the responsibility, the lack of, and where they're at. But notice, and I'll bring us to it in detail when we get there, which is very soon, very soon, I think. But notice how at that time, when there are those who are going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this? Didn't I do that in your name? And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. He does not say, depart from me. I knew you and you disappointed me. I knew you and you disobeyed. I knew you and you weren't obedient. So I'm done with you. No. He says, I never knew you. Do you yourself know with the discernment of the Holy Spirit right now, people who think they are gods and are not? I know them. They're in cults. Yeah. They're in other false ideas. And they think that they're fine. How many do we witness to that so want we're, God we're on their terms? In relation. Absolutely. Pam, you nailed it. They have a religion, not a relationship. What matters is what we do with Jesus. That's the whole crux of it. You want to know whether they're called a cult or not? The, the litmus test? What do they do? With Jesus. Mm. If Let Jesus and Satan are brothers, run. Yeah. If Jesus is less than very God himself, run. Yes. If Jesus is equal to God, is God himself, the two are one, mm. stay, mm -hmm. learn, grow, be disciple, know him personally. Don't just know him in your head either. How many people are going to miss heaven by 18 inches? Yeah. The difference from the head to the heart, 18 inches. The devil knows who the Lord is. The demons tremble at his name, but they're not given heaven. They have knowledge, but they haven't opened up their heart. Now, I challenge all of you in this room because I'm not here to judge you. God alone knows your heart. Do you have the circumcision of your heart? If you've opened up your heart to the Lord to be your Savior and you meant it, you don't need to ever do it again. You may break your fellowship and need to confess that and get back into right relationship with the Lord and accept the consequences that come with disobedience, but you never need to pray, Oh, Lord, come into my heart, forgive my sin. Because when you did that that first time and meant it, he said, I forgive you your sins, past, present, and future. Now, always I have to put the disclaimer on it. Oh, that we can go do anything we want. We can act as wild and crazy and hairy and do anything we want. It doesn't matter. We're already forgiven. What did Paul say to that? God forbid. God forbid. Anathema. Never let me. Far from me. No. No. So it does not give us a freedom. But when we are corrected, and if you're not corrected, if you're not child trained, question whether you belong to him because everybody needs child training everybody right. needs correction it doesn't have to be major he doesn't have to be with a two by four <laughs> sometimes some people need that but it can be the quiet still voice that just says are you sure you know have you checked with me are you doing this right you know just that quiet little you take a ship on the ocean that's headed for a target and if they don't constantly correct because of the ebb and the flow They'll miss their mark. By the time they get to their, the, their destination, they'll be way off. But if they constantly listen to those little checks, those little, they stay right and boom. It amazes me how they can nail their target. That's what we do. 
So don't let those verses scare you. Let them give you the joy. I'm his. I belong him. I don't have to be perfect. Thank you, Lord, because I'm not. <laughs> I got out of the bed this morning with every intent to be perfect before him. And I'll tell you honestly, it's 10 to 3 and I didn't succeed. And I got a half a day to go still. Now, am I aware of every way I blew it? No, because I'm not even knowledgeable enough to know. And I know that I know that I know the Lord came back for us right now. I'm gone. I'm His. I belong to Him. And it's on His work. It's on His blood. And He didn't ever say, do it again. Do it again. Do it again. No. 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 You open up that heart, you let it circumcise your heart, and then you want to live at life spiritually, walk with Him. Be obedient. Listen to his voice. Move at the checks and balances. Don't wait till you're so far off that he has to use a heavy hand to get you back in. But thank God, even there, his mercy endures. And he will, when he has to, with a heavy hand, bring someone back in. Yeah, I think those uh, verses are more uh, of an encouragement. It, to me, it's encouraging. For, it's, for us to be a steadfast. Yes, yes. And we do want to be steadfast. You yeah. hit it exactly. <laughs> Okay, now, let me give you the fact that we see Old, Testaments, Old, Testament, Old Testament saints, some at least, and, and I think I'm of this opinion that wasn't all, but at least some, were resurrected at the time of Yeshua's uh, death on the cross. Remember, they don't come out of the grave until after he resurrects, okay? But what I'm talking about is Matthew 27. Let me take you there real quickly. Matthew 27. And this is important because we, I talked about why I think that this time is representing Old Testament and New Testament saints. Matthew 27, verse 50. Uh, 27 is the crucifixion. I'm trying to get down to 50. There we go. Verse 50 says, But Yeshua again, crying out in a loud voice, lifted up his spirit. At that moment, oh, now I know which Bible. Man, I'm in the complete Jewish Bible. That's the word why the words have been a little different. At that moment, the veil, Nerchit, in the temple was ripped in two from top to bottom. And there was an earthquake with rocks splitting apart. Also the graves were opened and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. Now you may have it slightly different in your version and it might even be a little more accurate. Verse 53 says, no, here it is. So it gives it in here. And after Yeshua rose, they came out of the graves and went into the holy city where many people saw them. I think the graves that were opened were ones who had died recently to be a testimony to the people who were living then of the power of the resurrection also. I think that's why they were the ones chosen. I don't think every grave of all time split open and all the people were resurrected. I believe that we'll see Old Testament saints resurrected at a different time that I'll bring you in when we go through the, the um, resurrection, the first resurrection, which is in three phases, and the second resurrection, which is unto death, eternal death. It's the one that we have no part of. It's the one that, that stands at the great white throne. But my point here is just to show you that we do have at least a sampling of first fruits. The Lord was the first fruits. That's why he had to be raised first. And remember, when he died, it was his fleshly body that died. It was the fleshly body that was laid in that tomb. It was not the Lord himself. His spirit had departed from that body. Remember, he gave his spirit into the hands of God. His spirit went into the paradise side of Sheol. That's why he said to the thief on the cross, Today I will be with you in paradise. He did not go into the suffering side. He did not take the flames of hell for us. He didn't need to. The punishment had been paid by the death. The wages of sin is death. It's not the wages of sin is hell. The wages of sin is death. That death, we know from Viacra, Leviticus 17, 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you on the altar for the remission of sins, for without the shedding of blood is not forgiveness of sin. How did God do that? How did he fulfill Leviticus 17, 11? And this is a great verse to give to our Jewish people because it's right in their Torah. How he did it in that sinless blood of Yeshua Jesus. That's the blood that God gave on the altar. He gave his own blood. That way it was sinless blood. Leviticus 17, 11. Good question, because it's a good verse. 
Leviticus 17, 11, foreshadowing, telling how God was going to do it all, the Lamb of God who would give his life to take away the sins of the world. So it was his shed blood that was going to conquer sin and death for us. That's why on the cross, he said, and it's given to us in Greek, telestai, it is finished. Now, if I tell you something's finished, it's done. Put a period there. Don't go on. It's done. If I give it to you in the Greek tense, it happens at this moment in time, and here's the results forever. That's what Hallelujah. God said. It is finished, or what Yeshua Jesus said, who is the voice of God? He came to do the will of the Father. Yeshua Jesus said, it is finished, and the results go on forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise Him forever. It was finished to prove to a world that needed to see it, who had been seeing the Lord, who had been seeing him do miracles. Now, can you imagine? <laughs> and here's where the Bible's silent. So we're using our imagination. But can you imagine after the Lord has raised from the dead and this dead one has come out of the grave, comes to your door. I'm here. Wait a minute. I attended your funeral. I cried because you were separate from us. We laid your body in the tomb. How on earth are you here? But yet, I see you. I can touch you. I can feel you. I can't ignore the evidence. How did you resurrect? Well, I resurrected in the power of my Savior, of my God. He is Lord. He arose first. He is alive. Hallelujah. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. And the people would have to say, oh, wow. And if they're smart, fall on their face. I give you my life, Lord. You are God. I want you to be my ruler. I want you to be my savior. I want your power. I want to be in line with you. I don't get why masses didn't turn to him. I don't get it. I don't get why he does the loaves and fishes and the next day they show up wanting loaves and fishes instead of wanting him. They came for the stomach. They came for the things that feel good to the flesh. They were missing the whole picture. God did everything to give them the picture. That's why he says in Luke 16, when he gives us a picture of that eternal suffering side, how when when um, the rich man, the, the one who was in the suffering side, said, send Lazarus back, that he goes back from the dead, that he testified to my brothers, and so that they will come here. And the Lord said, if even one came back from the dead, they won't believe well, guess what? One came back from the dead. And unfortunately, they still don't believe. Do you know there is more substantial proof, eyewitness proof, that Yeshua Jesus rose from the dead than there is that George Washington lived and was our first president? Yet, is there anyone in this room who will deny that George Washington was a real person, lived in real time, and was the first president of the United States? I don't see a hand going up. And yet there was more proof. When the words were written and recorded, they were there. They could have said, lie, lie, lie. Remember how when he was buried in the tomb, they even went to Pilate and said, he said he was going to raise in three days. They might steal his body and hide it somewhere. Let's put your seal on the tomb so that no one can touch that tomb without being in trouble with you so that they can't fabricate this lie. Well, sealing that tomb couldn't keep my Savior in that tomb. And the only thing put in there was that earthly body that he raised from the dead to because he walked in that body. He appeared in a room. It was in that for room. Boom, he was there. He appeared to Mary at Miriam at the tomb. Crying so hard she couldn't even see who it was till she heard him call her by name. He appeared to Cephas, Kepa, Peter. He showed Peter. Why did he single Peter out? I think because he knew Peter needed that. Peter denied him. Peter was crushed. Peter's, oh, I, I feel for him. The Lord took time with him. The Lord showed himself to the eleven in the upper room and to the others who were gathered with them. The Lord showed himself at one point to five hundred people. Now, you try pulling that stunt, fool 500 people, and have all 500 say the same story who say, no, this is true. I was there. I saw him. 
I was there, I saw, I was there, I saw. How many do you need to take into a court before the judge says truth? Two or three witnesses, let a thing be established. 500 at one time. He left plenty of proof. And we know the proof is living in us today. Whew. Okay, back on track. <laughs> okay, let's go back to Revelation. We've got a wonderful, amazing God who has a fantastic plan. And that plan involves us ruling and reigning with him one day. And that's what we're bringing out. He's promised it to the 12 Talmudim that they would rule over Israel, and he's promised it to his, what we'll call right now, for sake of purposes, his church body, that we will also rule and reign with him. He's got a big world that he's going to need people going out and helping those, I shouldn't say people, because we're not going to be normal people, mm -hmm. we're going to be those who have slipped on immorality now. We're going to be, I said it wrong again, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> immortality. <laughs> One little letter makes a big difference. <laughs> Immortality. We're not going to be in human form where we have to eat, where we have to sleep, where we get cut and we bleed. We're going to be like the Lord himself. Flesh and bone, but no blood now. The blood is not going to be the life now. We're going to be able to suddenly be somewhere and, and set things in order and be that eyewitness and tell him, I have dwelt with the Lord in heaven. Oh. Wow, yeah, yeah, can you, I can't hardly wait. <laughs> I get so excited, I want to get out here. <laughs> okay, okay. Judgment is given to us also, 1 Corinthians, chapter 6. 1 Corinthians, chapter 6. You got to forgive me a little bit. I'm going to show that. <laughs> oh, I did, I did. I've given us 1 Corinthians 6 also. Okay, that judgment was given to us also, because that's not talking to the Talmudim, that's not talking in Old Testament times, that's talking to a church body, much like what we are today, a church body, okay, we're all part of that body of the Lord, okay, so I have given that to you, um, and I think I'm also taking you to 2 Timothy, if not, oh yeah, I did all those, okay, okay, now, who are we going to judge, let's look at that, that's where I'm at, who are we going to judge, okay, we know that judgment was given to us. It is quite possible that God will use us in the judging of the Gentiles. I will bring that out. We'll, we also see there's judgment of Israel, because we know that the 12 tribes are, are judging Israel too. So let's look. Um, I'm, in, I'm going to read the Ezekiel scripture I've given to you first, because then we're going to back up and we're going to take Matthew 25. And we're going to take it in more detail than I usually do, because I think this is really critical for understanding, because so many people get confused in this. So we're going to go to, to Matthew 25 um, completely, but look real quick at Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 33. Right after Jeremiah, if you find Jeremiah, if you're there. Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 33 through 38. <clears throat> okay, I think you all know Ezekiel is a prophet of God in what we'll call Old Testament times, original covenant times. Watchmen. The watchman, yes, watchman upon the walls, true. Okay, as I live, says Adonai Elohim. Who's talking? Lord God, his voice. As I live, I swear that surely with a mighty hand, with a stretched out arm, and with poured out fury, I myself will be king over you. Now, is he talking to the church body? No. Israel, good, Israel, it's Ezekiel, there's no church yet, there's no church body, they have no idea about that, so he's talking to Ezekiel, who is Jewish, who is trying to be a prophet to his people Israel, okay, so keep that in mind as you read it, so who is he going to be king over, Israel, okay, I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you were scattered with a mighty hand, with the outstretched arm, and with poured out fury, where are the Jewish people today? Scattered out. All those countries that God's going to bring us back. Stretch out his arm to scatter us. He'll stretch out his arm to gather us back. Okay, it's by his power. He is the one who is doing it. And that poured out fury, I believe, is a reference to the tribulation when the fury of God was poured out. It's poured out on Israel as well as on the rest of the nations. It is a worldwide tribulation. Remember, that's one of the big things that separates it from other horrendous tribulations, like the Holocaust. We don't need to go any further back than that. I can take you back to Crusaders and other times. 
Those were horrible, but they were in a certain area for a period of time. The tribulation is worldwide. The world suffers in the tribulation. The wrath of God is poured out on the sin of this sin-soaked world. It is not that God's mad at Israel and pouring out and beating Israel. No, God keeps his hand on Israel. We're going to see that he brings Israel through. He promises Israel in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 30, you will go into a time of trouble. It's called Yaakov's trouble, Jacob's trouble. You will go into Jacob's trouble, but I will bring you out of Jacob's trouble. Mm -hmm. Now, we saw when we talked about Revelation 3, where it talked about the church of Philadelphia, that we're kept away from. We're kept from the hour of. We are not the earth dwellers that go through. We are the people whose citizenship is in heaven. We are in a different place during the time the wrath is poured out. We know we're in heaven. We've talked about that. We know it's the time when I believe the Bema seat is taking place. We're getting our rewards because we come back with him at the end of the tribulation showing we have received our rewards. We're in the gown of righteousness that he's clothed us in. We're coming back with him to rule and reign. Well, that means that we've already stood before him for our rewards so that, that we know where we stand with the Lord. It's not up for... Who am I? Where am I? How do I belong? No, we know. We've got our pattern also. That when he pours out that fury on the earth, we are not there. He's pouring it out. In this case, he's telling the land of Israel that they're going to face it. Verse 35. Then I will bring you into the desert of the peoples, judge you face to face. God's the one meeting out judgment in the tribulation. We have many times when man's atrocities to man were horrendous, but now we have God's judgment. And even though it is very harsh, it is fair, it is right, it is just. Yeah. God was very patient, long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. He waited till that cup of iniquity was so full, it was to the brim and ready to overflow. Overflow. Remember when we talked about the grapes that were, that were ready to explode because they were overripe? It wasn't because it was something good. It was something horrible. And it was ready to just explode and ooze its evilness. And God brings it down. That's... Fair. That's right. That's judging the way he should. Verse 37, I will make you pass under the crook and bring you in, into the obligations of the covenant. That crook is the shepherd's crook. Remember when the shepherd would put his, his staff out and the sheep all had to come under that one by one through the gate into the fold that night? Remember that was there so that he would, they, they couldn't just run in all together at once because how are sheep? <laughs> right? But by having to come in one by one, he had a moment to be able to look at each sheep. Oh, okay, this one's gotten a cut here. I need to put sap on that one tonight. This one has a tear on the side. That could get infected. I need to take care of that one. It was his way of having that moment with yeah, each really precious nice. little sheep to see and tend to their needs. And that crook that, that had that, awesome. that bend was what the shepherd would use to pull that sheep up out of that ditch that the sheep got itself into. Because what does sheep do? Right off the edge, boom, right there. What's the next one do? Follow. What's the next one do? Follow. I'm going to bring you a picture I accidentally got with the sea galley in the background. And it has sheep going right across, and they're one following the other. If I can find it and get it in the print the slide, I'll bring it in, and I'll show you. Because when I found that when I got home, I went, wow, God, what an awesome picture you gave me. God knows each of us, and he is our shepherd. And he's telling Israel, even in your rebellion, I am there to take care of your needs. I will rid you of the rebels who are in revolt against me. I will bring, you, bring them out from the land where they are living, but they will not enter the land of Israel. Then you will know I'm out of nine. He was foreshadowing what he did originally, bringing them back out of captivity, but it's looking all the way to the tribulation. It's looking to the time when Israel will suffer consequences along with the rest of the world. But God has already told them, I'm going to bring you back from the four corners. I'm going to bring you in. When I am there to rule and reign, I will bring you in, set up the, the 12 um, tribes, the heads, to be your rulers. They're under me. They have my wisdom, and they'll meet our judgment also. And we will see a different world during the millennial time than what we are dealing with today. Yes? In the same the, uh, passage you were talking about, verse 38, 
and I will purge out from among you the rebels. Is he talking about the synagogue of Satan in Revelation? It, it, very easily, yes. Okay. Very easily. It could also be the enemy at large, but yes, there are those who call themselves Jews, and God says, or, or Yeshua says, whichever way you want it, in the book of Revelation, they're the synagogue of Satan. That is unfortunately true today. There are those who think they are worshiping God, think they are in obedience to God, think that they are serving and honoring God, and they are not. We see Saul, who became Paul, in that same light. Yeah. He's persecuting the believers. Yeah. I'm doing God a favor. I got another one, God. I got another one. And God has knocked him off his high horse and said, why are you persecuting me? <laughs> who are you, Lord? And that Lord was respectfully, who are you, Lord? And the Lord blinded him physically that he might open his eyes spiritually and Shaol turns from Shaol to what we call Paul. We see the turnaround. But the synagogue of Satan, we saw it in the Smyrna church and we saw it in the name another time. I can't remember, but it's named twice that they're sitting where Satan dwells. It's found in Philadelphia. Also. Not in Philadelphia. Not in Philadelphia. Smyrna? Philadelphia is the only church that, that does not have judgment oh, given to it. That's why... Um, Revelation 3, about verse 10, is our Philadelphia church. Um, oh, okay, okay. I have to stand corrected. I have to stand corrected. Thank you, um, Arlu. Okay. Um, to the church of Philadelphia, chapter 3, verse 7. I'm trying to skip through. We get down to, um, in verse 8, I've opened the door in front of you. No one can shut it. I know you have that little power, yet you've obeyed my message and not disown me. This is where he opens the door that we take the gospel out. Here I will give you some from the synagogue of the adversary, those who call themselves Jews but aren't. On the contrary, they are lying to see. I will cause them to come and prostrate themselves at their feet. They will know that I have loved you. This is where some of the Jews are going to be corrected by the church. And they're going to be come, coming out of the, the, uh, the synagogue of Satan. And they're going to have to realize this is where the true God is. The true God is my Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. And if they do not, then they will fall in, in uh, respect to the true God. But hopefully their hearts will turn and they will be falling in adoration instead. Um, verse 10, because you did obey my message about persevering, I will keep you, so keep you from the time, from the hour of tribulation that coming upon the whole world to put the people living on earth, the earth dwellers, to the test. The earth dwellers are the ones who suffer, who have the test of the tribulation to purge out, to bring them into right relationship. Remember, throughout the whole the tribulation, they can get saved. Many will get saved. Many will lose their heads for their faith. They're beheaded. So many, we can't number them under the throne. They have come out from that time. They have had their, their robes washed in the blood of Yeshua, Jesus. So many do get saved, Jew and Gentile. We see the, the, the first uprising that we see is the 144,000. Are they Jewish or are they Gentile? Jewish. Jewish. 12 tribes, 12 names, 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes. I don't think you can get more Jewish than that. They are raised up, as someone called them, Jewish Billy Grahams. They're raised up, sealed with the seal of the Lord to take the message out. They are representing what Israel should have done when Israel didn't. It goes back to Israel when the church is gone, and these will carry it out. And they can't be harmed until their work is done, and they're going to be able to take it to the ends of the earth. So we have many Jewish people right there saved, and as people hear them, they're going to get saved. They're going to have good results. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Every precious soul to get saved. And those that can't save will be Jewish people and Gentile people. So that's what we're seeing. Thank you, Lord. When it talks about them being beheaded, there's only one point in time where it gives two different uh, descriptions where you could say, okay, maybe this is the Jewish believers and this is the Gentile believers, but usually you can't tell any difference. It's, it's synonymous because they're both one. The same way, in this church age, Jew and Gentile are saved alike, one the same. One new man, made up of Jewish and Gentile. We walk it together. Amen. We're no different. Amen. We come to the Lord the same way. Same level, same entry, same everything. That's where it's at today. Okay, let's look at this. Let's go. Yeah, let's hurry. 
Well, not hurt, but let's get to Matthew, because if we don't get started now, we, I don't know that we can get through it, and hopefully we'll get through it all. We're going to Matthew 25, okay? Now, keep in mind, Matthew is written by a Jewish man who is part of Israel. He is not writing during the church age time when he's got the church body and he's writing to the church. He's writing to a very Jewish audience. He's writing to his peers. He's writing with the Jewish mind, okay? So we have to step into that to seem to understand who he's talking to and what he's expressing and what he's bringing. Now, I've taken you for so long through Matthew 24. I think you understand that. We went through all of that. We even saw that the rapture is not in Matthew 24, where many want to put it, where the two are in the field and one is taken and the other is left. And people say, oh, that's the rapture. They were taken in the rapture. But remember it says as it was in the days of Noah, so it would be with these. And the ones that were taken in the day of Noah, how were they taken? In the blood. That was judgment. The ones taken were not saved. They, they, they perished. Their lives were lost. The saved were in the ark. They were the only ones saved. God brought it down to one family, saved that family, and started his followers from that family. So if we follow it and keep it the same... How are they taken here? In judgment. The one left is the one left to go into the kingdom. The one taken was taken away in judgment. Now keep that in mind because that's Matthew 24. I can open up this one too because I get too limited with one Bible. That's Matthew 24, what I've just given you in a nutshell that we've spent verse by verse, phrase by phrase, and so many times. It starts with... Uh, um, okay. Uh, I'm going to do 25, but I'm showing you, I'm, I'm giving you the background to 25. Yeah, so in 24, I'm bringing you, um, and I'm scanning quickly. Okay, here we go. Where the two are taken in judgment. You'd have to start with verse 36, okay? All the way up to verse 36, we've been given an order. Verse 15, we have the abomination of desolation set up. We know that's the middle of the tribulation. I think almost everybody agrees on that point. Okay, then by the time you get to... Uh, 26 through 28, maybe. Um, well, verse 21 tells us now it's great tribulation, the term given to the last half of the tribulation. Backs up that 15 is at the midpoint, okay? Then when you get down to 26, um, it, it's saying, you know, don't believe it when they say, oh, the Messiah's over here, oh, he's over here. Everyone's going to see the return of the Messiah, 27 and 28. As lightning comes out of the east, shines to the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Again, a messianic title, because he's talking to Jewish people who are going to know that name Son of Man is talking about God. When he's saying that, that the whole world is going to see his return, is that rapture? No. No. No, the whole world does not see the Lord come in rapture. And he doesn't do what we see follows in the rapture. He comes in the air. And we are caught up to meet him in the air, and we're given the name rapture from the Latin rapturo. If you don't like that word, take it all the way back to the Greek word that was written at this time and call it the great snatching away. Okay, because that's what it is. Okay, they were snatched away. Okay, he does not come. Red represents the Lord. He does not come all the way down to earth. This is the earthly line. He does here where he dies on the cross. He goes up in ascension, and he gives the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's your red lines. Now, here's your red line. He comes back. He calls us up. We meet him in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Okay, we cease being earth dwellers. We cease living on this earth. But even while we're living on this earth now, where's our citizenship, according to Shaul Paul, 1 Corinthians? In heaven. So we are heaven people, heavenly people. We right now are ambassadors. What's an ambassador? One who has been sent from his home to represent the leadership of his home to another group. That's who we are. Are we doing a good job of representing our Lord? I hope individually we are, but like Tor says, probably not. If we really were doing our job, the church would be shaking this earth. Right. We would see such power move through the church and through the people that they'd be breaking down the doors to get there. Now, we're not doing such a poor job that they don't know there's a difference because we do see that. When 9-11 happened, the churches were full. They went to the churches. I got phone calls. 
When are you having a prayer meeting? When are you having a Bible study? I want to get in on it. What's going on? You know, they know we're in a tour, and so we are not doing such a poor job that they aren't seeing it. But if we're really living transformed lives, that's an open invitation. Who wouldn't want that? They watch you go through a trial that now they're going through, and they saw you shine through it, have strength, have power, have wisdom, have answers. You've done a great job. Hey, how'd you do that? What's your secret? Let me tell you my secret. And my secret can be your secret because it's not a secret. It's the Lord. Yeah. And we get to witness. That's what we should be doing. We should be so full of the Spirit that people want to come in. They want to be a part of the church. That's where we should be. So back to this. Back to, to where I am. I keep going off today. Sorry. Um, okay. We're, we're back. We're going. To, oh, oh, oh. Okay. I'm telling you here. So rapture. Coming in the air is not seen by the earthly people. They are going to wonder what happened, because oh, yeah. obviously we disappear. But you know what? Satan already has begun to get answers out there. Do you know in New Age is the belief that those people called the Christians are holding back the harmony of the world? We want that age of Aquarius to come. We want that harmony to come. And so when we disappear, they're already ready with the answer. It's already in books that I've read and others have read that says those people have been taken away that they can have their minds reset. They need to learn and understand so that they don't cause this division. And when they're ready, they're going to be brought back. So don't worry about them. They're fine. They're fine. They're being taken care of. But they're going to come back. <laughs> You're right. They're right on that point. But there's going to be many answers out there. There's going to be the, the light goes out so strong that God says it would even deceive the believers if it was possible. It's going to be very hard for people to believe because of the lie that's out there, the deception, the smokescreen that Satan is going to be putting up. And remember, God has removed his hand of protection. He has not removed his spirit. The spirit of God has moved over the face of this earth since Bereshit went to the second verse of our scriptures when the spirit of God moved over the face of the earth if the spirit of God was gone no one would get saved mm -hmm. because no one comes to the father but by the spirit tugging at them mm -hmm. so the spirit of God is still going to be alive and moving and powerful and how are the first ones going to get saved hopefully because spirit. of us well yes because of the Holy Spirit but hopefully because we are doing our job we're out there witnessing. We're telling them. I have told people who've gotten so close to getting saved. I don't cast my pearls before swine, before swine and tell them ahead of time. But when we're coming to that point that we have to, I have told some. You know what? If I disappear, you need to know that was foretold here. You need to get into these scriptures. I give them the scriptures. I tell them, you need to read. This is going to be your roadmap. This is going to tell you what to do, what not to do. This is going to be everything you need to survive to end up in heaven with me one day. Whether you survive all the way through on earth or whether your life is taken from you on earth, here's what you need to know. Okay, so, rapture curse. Oh, God, hallelujah. <laughs> and that person says, wow, where is she? She said this. She warned me about this. I better check out those <coughs> scriptures because now I believe it. And they're going to be one of the first ones, I believe, that will be saved. And in them, God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, moves on 144,000 Jewish ones who will evangelize the world, not just Israel. They're going to evangelize the world. Many will get saved. God's mighty hand of power will be at work. He never <coughs> leaves and leaves it to his own. If he did, I don't think he'd survive 24 hours before it just absolutely disintegrated on itself because that's where man is. And he even says, if I didn't come back at the end, if I didn't cut those days short, not any flesh would be left alive. We know that's possible today. Yeah. While back they didn't know it was possible, that just tells us we're all the closer. And we can understand more because the closer you get, the more you understand. So, again, back on track, we have in verses 27 and 28, 27, the whole world sees his coming. That tells us that is second coming. That is when he comes down to the earth to the battle of Armageddon, puts a stop to the battle of Armageddon. The whole world is going to see that. They're going to be able to see it through satellite television, through your little smartphones, through whatever means God wants, but the eyes will also see. God may miraculously bend the refraction of the light rays and carry it that way to the world. God is able. However he wants to do it, he does it. That's what we're seeing in verse 27. 
everyone will see the Son of Man return. And how does he return? Lowly, suffering servant, riding on the donkey? Oh, no. Remember our description in chapter 19? He comes back as king of kings, wearing the diadem, the crowns. He comes as Lord of lords. He has his name on his thigh. He has his sword. And I believe that sword is his word. I don't believe that he's going to go and buy a sword, boom, boom, boom. But by his word, he created this world by his, his word. Those who will be annihilated will be annihilated. And the first he's going to take out is that beast, that, that Antichrist who has been against him, who is full of Satan and spewing blasphemies against him, is going to be stopped. That's what we're reading here. Yes, hallelujah. <coughs> now, how do I know it's that time? Look at verse 28. Wherever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. What did we just study? At the start of the millennium, they're going to be putting up signs that here's a dead body that needs to be buried. And remember, it's not going to be the whole body, it's going to be the bones, because the vultures have come to eat the flesh, to pick off the flesh. As gross and disgusting as that is, it is a foul scene, and I say that on purpose, foul scene. It's God's way of getting rid of the carnage quickly, because that brings more death and, you know, disease, the 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 maggots and the, I won't go there, okay? I don't even look in my mind to there. But God brings it down to bones, and yet those bones need to be buried. Those bones will be buried. So we know this is that supper that the eagles are invited to that God's told us about. Verse 29 says, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Now, it's going to go back and give us a little more description because remember the tribulation is seven years long. So he's going to give us a few more signs. The sun darkened, the moon won't give us light, the stars fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Then, that's how the culmination, when we got to those last um, bowls that were out, remember, it was boom, 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 boom. It wasn't one in a long time, and it's ended. One was going on while well, two happened. Two's still going on while well, three is happening. Three's going on while well, four is happening. Boom, 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 boom. It is massive it is wide it is a power that is to be reckoned with i mean how many times what do people even call now unsaved people there's a tornado they call it an act of god you know they should call the blessings an act of god too they miss that part but in essence they get it right it's not mother nature that's mad it is god in control and when the heavens shake when the sun doesn't shine the moon doesn't get its light and we talked about all those things in these bowls that were poured out that's when the Son of Man appears that we've just read about in verse 28. And then shall all the... Of Matthew 24, because I'm giving the background to 25. Sorry, I'm giving the background to 25 to get us in the right place, okay? Then the Son of Man in heaven appears, and then all the tribes of the earth mourn as they see the Son of Man coming in clouds of heaven with power and great glory, okay? And then he tells that the angels are going to be with them, and we know that we're going to be with them. Verse 36 tells us that that day and hour no man knows, not the angels in heaven, my Father only. Then it tells us that it was in the days of Noah, the ones taken in judgment. They're not going to know when that day is going to come. Now, living in the tribulation period, they can count pretty close because we know it's a seven-year period. But remember, God says the time could be or will be shortened. So we don't know exactly. They don't know the exact day. They're even going to know very closely to when he can come. We who are looking for the rapture have no idea. It could be this year. It may be next year. We thought it could be last year. And we're right because we're told it's imminent. Imminent means it can happen now. Okay, so here's your difference again. Okay, so the, the one left is left in judgment. It goes on down there. Then if we start with, I think we can, start with 25 and verse 1. It starts with the word then. Okay, go back to 24, 29, immediately after those things, okay? Or you may have the word then, okay? Same word in the, in the Greek. We see it in 29, um, actually, I'm sorry, we see it in 30. That's where the then is. And then shall appear, okay? So we have a then in 25, 1. We have a then in verse 30. We have a then in verse 40. Then two are in the field, one's taken in judgment ones left to go into the kingdom, okay? 25-1 is the third time that we see the word then. Mm -hmm. Then, when you have an E in it, if you ever wonder how to not confuse then and then, then is used in comparison, but this is the easy way to remember the E in them is the E 
in time. When you use them, you're talking about time. When you're using them, you're talking about a comparison rather than greater than. There's your comparison, here's your time. So, 24 verse, <laughs> you need English to understand the scriptures. When I went to study the Greek, my Greek professor said, your English teachers don't do you justice. Go get this little booklet that'll teach you English so you can understand Greek. And he was right, I used that little booklet to death. <laughs> Uh, it, it's, I'll, I'll have to remember the name, but it, it goes along with a Greek course. It helps you understand. I'll have to look it up. Okay, so, yeah, so verse 30, then comes the, the Son of Man. And verse 40, then two are left. One goes into the kingdom, the other goes into judgment. Then, verse, two, verse 1 of chapter 25, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. Now, we've said the kingdom of heaven is power. It's in heaven. The kingdom of heaven is going to come down to earth. What did Yeshua pray? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's talking about the millennial reign. The millennial reign is the kingdom of God on earth. Okay? When the Lord walked among them, he said, the kingdom of God is among you even now. You don't, yes. you don't know it. Yes, he is yes. the kingdom. He's the power. Kingdom power, resurrection power. The dead come to life. The blind see. The lame walk. The, the deaf hear. That's all power. That's what we see in kingdom power. We know it's in the heavens ruling. Nothing ever stops the power of God. We know that. But it's going to come down to earth because he's going to rule and reign on earth. So, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. Okay, now we're going into a picture, an object lesson to teach us. Okay, so we have to decide what does this mean. We have to look for the understanding. Okay, um, I gave you the order, by the way. The order of 24-29 was tribulation. 24-30 is your second coming. You see him come. 24-40 is the judgment. And 25-1 is the kingdom. So the judgments happen just prior to this kingdom. The judgment's going, who goes in the kingdom, who doesn't. Okay? And that's what we're going to see revealed here. Okay, so now it's this like in the millennial kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, not rapture, the kingdom of heaven brought down to earth. What's been promised to Israel, the rule and reign on earth, is like it. It resembles ten virgins. Okay, now, we don't find anything significant about the number ten. It's, that's not the idea here. We'll go, go past that and see that the ten virgins are going to be representing the professing nation of Israel. Now, remember, the church hasn't been yet, so it's not talking to the church. It's not representing the church. It is how the Jewish people saw the timeline. And remember, this is all blank. I don't have my little piece here, but this is all blank. When you see the prophecies in the old, it goes right over the church age. It does not talk about the church age. You don't read about the rapture in Old Testament verses. You read in that original um, covenant, because I like that better, you read of the, the coming of the Lord, the coming of the Messiah. You read of the heavenly. You're not reading of this time with his body. Remember when Paul is raised up to tell us about this time, he says it's a mystery now being revealed. Mystery means it's something that's been hidden. It was hidden from them. Why? Because when Yeshua is offering the kingdom right here, um, actually, yeah, I'm, I'm going to say it right after, no, 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 I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong side. Right after, right before he ascends into heaven, and the Holy Spirit comes down during this time, he has begun to offer the kingdom. If Israel would have recognized Yeshua as Messiah and as Savior, then John the Baptist, Yochanan, would have fulfilled Elijah's part of preparing the world, calling that the, the Messiah is coming, and the kingdom would have been set up. In the beginning of Acts, we see the kingdom is still being offered. If they would have come to the realization and accepted him as their Messiah, the kingdom would have come. Now, if they knew that this church age, which we know right now is about 2,000 years already, if they knew that had to come first, they, uh, uh, um, excuse me, how can you be offering us the kingdom? We know there's going to be at least 2,000 years before that kingdom comes, before we see our millennial reign. See, it wouldn't have been a fair offer to them. It would have been confusing to them. But not seeing that part, only being told 
about the plan that God has for Israel, they could look and see that God's promised them the kingdom. The Messiah will come and bring them the kingdom. So it was a legitimate offer to them. That's why it was hidden before. And that's why your charts that you have like mine, you can fold out that period of time and just see it the way Israel saw it. Okay? Daniel gives us prophecy that went from the time of Babylon all the way through to Armageddon. He does not mention the rapture. He had a great prophetic view, but he did not have a view of the church age because it wasn't for him. God raised up Paul to bring that to us. We're the ones living in it. We're the ones who need it. Is that a question, Eric? Yeah. Uh, don't they refer to the to the tribulation? As, isn't that the wedding? Because when we go up, don't we? That's when we all get our robes and stuff. And, and it's like seven years. They don't know Jewish wedding last seven a week. We so see like that, and years. we understand that, and we're going to get into that a little bit with the wedding feast that we're going to see in chapter 25. Yeah, okay. But they do, do not understand and know that that's happening at all. Okay, okay, They're okay. not seeing it promised to them because it wasn't shown to them. So they're representing the nation of Israel. They are professing. Okay. Now remember there's a difference between professing and possessing. Anyone can say anything. It's got to be in the heart. Okay, so yeah. they're representing the nation of Israel. They're not representing the bride. They're representing her attendants. Okay, who's the bride of, of Messiah? The church. Yeah. Church. 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 Right, okay. The bride's going to be with the group. But the attendants are separate from the bride. We're going to see that as we go on. We'll never get through all this in one, but we'll come to a stopping point because I'm not going to stop here. Now, any time the church is spoken of in scripture, it's always looked at as one. It's not looked at as a number, okay? That's another indication when there's ten virgins here, we're not looking at the body of Christ that's called the church. Um, 2 Corinthians 11, 2 says, I presented you a chaste virgin, okay? Singular, singular. Anytime the church is referred to, it's referred to singular. We know that we are one brought together. That was not one person. When Paul wrote that to the Corinthians talking about the church body, he wasn't saying, I'm presenting one person. I'm presenting one, yeah, one body. Because one body. we're one body, okay? We're all together. We're one body. So, ten is does. Yes, many parts. Many parts. But still one body. Right. So ten virgins yeah. are ten bodies. Okay? Yeah. So right there in any case does we're not talking about the church. Okay? Let's see what happens with these ten virgins. They took their lamps. Okay, so those lamps had uh, torches, they had a little wick and a space for oil. Oil in scripture is symbolic of the word of God. Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Okay? Let me show you Romans chapter 3 and verse 2. Romans chapter 3 and verse 2. And Romans gives us a lot of great doctrine. Um, verse 3, one, we have to see, see that to understand too. What advantage has the Jew? What is the value? Romans 3. What's the value being circumcised? Did the Jews have any advantage? And Paul says, yes, much in every way. In the first place, the Jews were entrusted with the very words of God. They were given the words of God. That is what the oil is representing. It's the word of God. Okay? The word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So it's not the Holy Spirit, the oil? The oil is the Holy Spirit. What's the Holy Spirit revealed to us? The, the word. word of God. How do you understand the scripture? So the Holy the same as the word. Yes, because how do you understand the scripture? By the Holy Spirit. We don't understand the scripture apart from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is also that unique third personification, can I say, of the one united God. That he is revealing to us who God is, who the Son is, who the Spirit is. Because they're three in one. None of them are less than the other. That's why no matter what we use here on this earth, it falls short. Even when I use the egg, the shell is not equal to the white. The white's not equal to the yolk. So it's not a perfect picture, but it gives us the idea. I've got one egg and I've got three parts, okay? The best example is that letter sheen for, for um, the Hebrew olive bay that stands for God, that has the three bars and the one base. 
all three of those bars are very equal. I'm not drawing you one because I'm yeah. not drawn equal. That if you look at a good one, we can call it up and I can show you, and anybody who's listening can go Google the letter Sheen. It's sometimes usually spelled S-H-I-N, but pronounced more Sheen than Shin, but you'll hear it both ways. But you can go look at it if you need to see a picture, and you'll see all three bars look identical. They're tied together at one base. Why? Because God is saying, I am God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one, three equal, three that just move in a different way. Can I say that to reveal to us who God is? God is so magnanimous. He can't be contained in, in one solid object. He has to be divided in that way, yet he's a chad, one united God. A chad, united, can be divided, not yachid, which also means one in Hebrew, but means one that can't be divided. I've got one jar. That's it, one jar. But I can have something that divides like that egg. Three parts, I saw one egg. Okay, so here again we see that, and we see that, that yes, the lamp is telling us it's the word of God. The Holy Spirit's the one who re reveals the word of God to us. The Jews were entrusted with the word of God. That's what they were to take out to the world. They were to be God's kohanim, God's priests. <coughs> um, look at 2 Peter 1.19, 2 Kepha 1.19, okay? And we read there, we have also a more sure word of prophecy in which we do well to take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. Who's the day star? Who's the morning star? That's a, a name for Yeshua. And he's saying, until you see him through all these rising in your heart, it is the Spirit, the Spirit who gives us prophecy, the Spirit who brings us light, the Spirit shining in a dark place. Who's helping you and I understand these words right here in this class? The Holy Spirit. Who do I pray before I begin class? Lord, get me out of the way. Let your spirit speak Amen. through me. Let them hear only your voice. If I teach it wrong, don't let their ears hear it wrong. Let it fall on their ears in pure truth. Let it be absorbed into their heart in the purity of the word of God. Because you see, I realize the high responsibility of handling the oracles of God. I am not worthy. I am your equal. I am not to be put on a pedestal. I am not to be a voice apart from it. I am to be a voice that speaks the very words of God. And I pray to God, let me do it every time I open my mouth. Let me do it. But knowing I'm human, knowing that I'm growing, knowing that I'm learning, you saw the way... Our Lou brought out a, a verse. I said, no, I don't think that's the Church of Philadelphia. And then here it is in Living Color. I said, oops, you're right, Our Lou. I am humble and willing to tell you, don't follow me. I make mistakes. But follow my God who is in me, who is revealing to you, the same as he is to me, via his Holy Spirit. That's why you're sealed with him. You're sealed with him for your redemption, but you're sealed with him also for his power, for his ability to transform you, because every day, we lay down our lives, living sacrifices under our holy God that we may become more like him, be more acceptable to him, be more pleasing to him, to be more like him. That's what I want to be. I want to be a light. Let my light so shine because it's not my light, it's this light. It's the light of the Holy Spirit. Let his light shine. So, realizing that, seeing that, that these, these torches, these lamps are going to be revealing the word of God. Um, the light shines in a dark place, Isaiah, Yeshia, Isaiah 61, 1, because we have to know, remember, staying with that Jewish mind, they are looking for a light. They are looking for the great light. They are used to hearing it referred in that way. Um, chapter 60, I'll stop there for a moment. 60 in verse 1, not on your cross-references, but out of in. Arise, shine, for thy light is come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. So what's the light? The glory of the Lord. What's the glory of the Lord? It's Shekinah glory. When it says in Hebrews 1, 2, that the glory of God is revealed, it's revealed in Yeshua. He is a reflection, the refraction that is perfect of God. He is God with flesh on. God took on human form. He slipped into time and space. He put on a face and we called him Yeshua, Jesus. He's the face of God. How do we know God? By knowing the Son. Remember he said to Philip, have you been with me so long and you don't know the Father? Amen. I'm here revealing the Father to you. I'm here doing his will. I'm not here a 
of my own, do my own thing apart from the will of the Father, I'm here to fulfill the will of the Father. He willingly brought himself down a little lower than the angels. Philippians 2, made himself human that he could one day raise us up onto that godly level. Wow. Oh, my. I know. Okay, let me finish verse 1, okay? And then I'll leave you on the cliff here so you want to get back. <laughs> um, one last verse on your way back to Revelation. Go to Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. Acts, give us the Acts of the Apostles. After Yeshua goes into heaven, we have the recording. We have the start of the church age. We have it all recorded there for us, and it continues on. It's the Acts of the Apostles, actually. Verse 38, how God anointed Yeshua of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. Okay, if Yeshua was anointed with the Holy Spirit, that's talking about in his humanity, because he grew in the knowledge of the Lord. When he was a year old, he wasn't speaking prophetic volumes that he did as an adult when he stepped in his ministry life. A one-year-old can't talk like that. That in his growing up years, that he lived perfectly because he was God. God in his spirit, anointed him, came on him, empowered him, worked through him, that the flesh was made perfect, was was perfect. I can't say was made, was perfect, because he, he was not born in sin. Remember, that's why we have to have virgin birth. If he was not virgin born, he would have been born with the sin nature, but he was not. He was conceived how? The Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit touch on that human life that we call Yeshua from its very inception. That Holy Spirit, God says, I anointed him with the power from the Holy Spirit. So he went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. And God was with him. That's talking about the human side. God was with the human side. God anointed the human side. God put the power of the Holy Spirit on the human side. So that human side was lifted up on a godly level. Do we understand? Are you all clear and say, oh, I get that? <laughs> Don't lie. <laughs> it's okay to not fully understand. Does it blow our mind? Oh, yes. yes. But once again, do I want a God that I can understand? Do I want a God that's on my level? No. No. Boy, would this world be in a world that heap of trouble more than this God. A lot of devils. Demons. 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 <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So we see the Holy Spirit's action. He consecrates. He heals. He empowers. The oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit's involvement. It was used to show here's the power of the Holy Spirit. It was used to anoint prophet, priest, and king. They were anointed by oil. So we see the anointing was the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of God through the Holy Spirit coming on them for them to perform the duties that they were being called to perform. We'll see more of that in verse 3, which we will not get to today, but I'm, I'm just gonna, going to tantalize you. I've got a pack of Matthew 25. I took it away. It might be over there, but I can get it faster here. Okay, so they took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Okay, they went out. They professed loyalty to the king. We're going out to meet the king. Okay, you've got ten that are going to do that. They're going out to meet the bridegroom. We know Yeshua Jesus is the bridegroom. Okay, so they come to the bride's house, or I'm sorry, the groom had come to the bride's house to obtain the bride. Remember when we're called up to heaven, our bridegroom has come, and he calls us out. He calls us to come up and to go with him, to go to the marriage. Okay, we know that. So here they're being called out to meet the bridegroom. Now, the bride and the bridegroom have a ceremony, a wedding ceremony. After the ceremony, there is a feast. The attendants are involved in that feast. We will see that, okay? The virgins are waiting his coming back to the house to resume those feasts. In fact, um, in the ancient, ancient Syrian and Latin Vulgates of these scriptures, it doesn't just say the bride. It says the bride and the bridegroom. They went forth to meet the bride and the bridegroom. Now, in our original manuscripts, we don't see that, but they had the fuller understanding because when the bridegroom comes back for that feast that we're going to see, it's the feast time, he comes back with his bride. 
bridegroom's not going to have the feast without his bride. She's going to be right there with him. We know that, okay? So, they're coming to meet the bridegroom, these ten virgins. I'm going to tell you, five are going to go in, and five are not. Why do some stay out? What's wrong with this picture? Come next week and find out. <laughs> so, we'll pick it up right there, and we're going to continue to go through 25. We're going to go through this. We're going to go through the talents. We're going to go through the sheep and goat judgment. Who's the sheep? Who's the goat? Where do the sheep end up? Where do the goats end up? I guarantee you it's two totally different places and two totally different groups of people. The who's who. Hmm. Come next week. We'll uh, get it right from the get-go. Okay, so I've been promising you Matthew 25. I did start. <laughs> then I'll deliver next week because we'll start right here picking up that they're looking for the bridegroom who comes with his bride and they're looking to go into the feast. They're looking to go to the wedding festivities and they are great. Who doesn't want to be a part? Okay. All right. Any questions to this point? Are we good? Okay. Let's close in prayer. Well, I have a question. Not so much on that. Uh, if, it's, if it's not on this, then well, let's close in prayer. Well, it's on the VSF. Me and wants to know the story of Solomon. Did he die lost or did he repent? The story of Solomon. I have to go look at this end to see why you're saying that, but nothing in my mind tells me that he was lost. Mm -hmm. The same way that a believer who, who sins is still saved. Still saved. Solomon yeah, has... Okay, I have to look at those scriptures to see what they're looking at and what they're saying, Kathy. I was telling you how God would not have had a right to go the goats that he did because he was not saved. Kathy's got a good point. Shlomo in the beginning, God's speaking to him, Solomon. God's speaking to him, and God asks him, what do you want? He asks for wisdom from God. That shows a relationship right there. That shows a sincere heart. He gets that wisdom from God. Unfortunately, he chooses as time moves on, he's getting an eye for the girls. <laughs> that gets him in trouble. Sorry, men, but your eye gets you in trouble. <laughs> and sorry, girls, but we do it. <laughs> okay? Those women brought in false gods. They brought in all kinds of idolatrous ways, and that's what gets Shlomo Solomon in trouble. But again, to have that heart right with God, that he's hearing the voice of God, God's speaking to him, God has put him in the position he's in, and says, you didn't even ask for wealth and riches, and I'm going to give them to you because you asked the better. You asked for wisdom for me that you might rule the people, judge them fairly. And boy, do we see it. Look at his wisdom. Two moms fighting over a baby. How's he going to know? Oh, let's DNA test, right? You know, they have DNA test. Come back and, you know, get, come back in two weeks. We'll have the results, and we'll tell you which mom is which. No. No. The son wasn't DNA. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Oh, bring me the baby. I'll cut this baby in half, and each can have a half. And Solomon apparently was, you know, they thought he's really going to do it. What's the real mom do? screams out. She wants the, her baby to be safe. Even if her baby can't be hers, she doesn't want her baby to die. Oh, give it to the other one. Give it to the other one. The other one didn't show any kind of care toward that baby. Oh, in a heartbeat, Shlomo knew who the real mom was. Give it to her. That's her baby. That's wisdom. Yes. And in every way that he judged, he had that wisdom. Yeah, that's a relationship with God. Nothing can separate us from the Lord, from the love of God. When we are his, we belong to him. Can we go into his presence in in um, in backwardness, in backsliding? Sure we can. Sadly. Do you want to face your Lord with the last things you've been doing were against him? and not in obedience to him, I don't want to. I love him. I want to please him. I want to be like him. I want him to give me that wisdom. I need the wisdom of Shlomo in my life. Lord God, give it to me. Let me hear. In the book of Ecclesiastes, in the last chapter, Solomon was declaring everything as vanity. Yes. And he was telling us yes. to obey God. Good point God also God. right there. Yeah. Yes, yes. And Ecclesiastes is him lashing out with a lot of his earthly, you know, everything is vanity. You know, he he wrote ups and downs. We have a name for that today, I think, would fit also him Also in well. Ecclesiastic, you can see his brokenness. Yes. Oh, you do see that brokenness. Wasted. 
Yes. Of, you know, he wasted a lot. Yes. Of yes. Of yes. 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 You know, yeah. a, a man that has such uh, power, fame, and, and good. Pray for him. And <laughs> yet, Pray for him. He <laughs> was so empty. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and God proves to us that in, in order for us to be uh, fulfilled in, in this world is to have him. And daily, constantly, he started out well, but he didn't end up well because he let the girls' gods get in there. He let the influences of the world get in there. We have to constantly stay with the Lord, pray daily, feed on him daily. Yesterday's laurels will not help us with tomorrow. They're wonderful. We stand on them in our faith. We rejoice. We recall that we have that fresh faith. We have to eat every day. Yeah. If you don't eat today, are you weak tonight? Yes. yes. If you don't eat tomorrow, are you weaker? Yes. yes. As it goes on, you get weaker and weaker and weaker. What do we need to eat? The bread of life. Bread of life. The Word of God. We yeah. have to take it in. That's where Shlomo blundered. He started out well, but he didn't continually feed himself with the mind of God. He didn't stay close to God. He allowed the luxuries of the world. He allowed... The, the false teachings, he allowed all of that to catch his eye and catch his attention. But I'll tell you, anyone who has power, anyone who has wealth, anyone who has fame, pray for them. In all honesty, those are traps. In all honesty, they are. If you've got them yourself, pray to God that you not put your trust in your wealth, fame, or riches, or whatever that third was. I missed the third. But pray that God keep you close to him, hearing his heartbeat every day, because those are traps in this world. They aren't necessarily the blessings everybody thinks they are. If they were, tell me why the people who are so rich are committing suicide. Tell me why those in Hollywood go to drugs, go upside down, are killing themselves continually. Where's the fulfillment? Where's the happiness? Where's the satisfaction? I'm pretty sure I was listening to you, but somebody was talking about Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones, and they have the song, I can't get no satisfaction, and he's never been satisfied. No. There's nothing that can satisfy that man because he has never turned to Christ. Right. The only thing that satisfies, God makes us all with that God-shaped hunger, mm -hmm. and he alone fills that vacuum perfectly. Made to measure, like the glove fits the hand. It is a perfect fit. He fills every nook and cranny when we let him. This is my favorite point. And more so, as believers, we need to pray for those that are. Yes, yes, pray, yes. We pray for I pray for Madonna. We pray for. I pray for Elton John. Pray for Brad Pitt. For Steven Spielberg. For. The Jewish community, we need to pray, pray for them, for them all. Yes. Praise yeah. God that we weren't in that limelight. Yes. It could have been us. And so we need to take it into there. Pray for them. them get saved and takes it in there. The power they can have among their own peers. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You know that it, as Christians, we have to have to have to uh, um, have to
thank you. We honor you. We praise you. We adore you. We thank you for your living word. Let us drink long at the well that we might be satisfied. And in that satisfaction, let us thank you, let us be joyful, and let us carry it to those in need because it's a thirsty world, Lord. Let us pour out into their lives that they too might know the living waters that never end. Thank you for each one here. Bless them, meet their needs, encourage them, strengthen them, and Lord, if you don't come for us, bring us back together next week that we can have another session at your feet. Praise you forever. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. What a